Hi. We were talking about the uh, the land on which these schools were building built. <clears throat> For example, the Grambo School was it donated a uh, Herman donated a couple acres of land there for school purposes and uh, a school was built and the school was used now that was true in the Wisniewski school the Santella school the Grishak school the Strisak school most of these schools were named after the people who donated the land but not necessarily now the Grambo school later on was called Beaver Creek school but the but there was a proviso in those deeds that if the land or the building was no longer used for school purposes, it would revert to the original grantor. And in the case of the Grambo School, many, many years later, probably 70 years later or 80 years later, Gerald got the school back. Gerald Grambo, who now who was the owner of the old Grambo homestead there, our, our property, and it was his grandfather, of course, that, that donated that land. So after the district got through using it, then the land went back to Gerald, and Gerald sold a section part of that land to his son Gerald, who now has a home on it. So that's what happened there. But nevertheless, Dad for a couple of years taught the Wisniewski School, and then for a couple of years he taught also the Gabrishak School, which is in the Posen District. Now if you're acquainted in the Posen District at all, it would be in the vicinity of what you call the uh, that would be in the vicinity of what you call the Flying Duck Bar, probably about two and a half miles from the Grambo home, but in Posen Township. And as while he was at the uh, at this school, teaching this school, that one of his students was Walter. He was a very, very successful businessman in Roger City and ran the Zagorski Plumbing and Heating, which was, which was in the old Stephen building. But he was, Walter was one of his students. Then he taught for probably four years, as I gather, at the Grambo School, which was, of course, only a couple of hundred yards away from the Grambo farm. And as well, he was at the Grambo School that he had some of his own brothers and sisters. He had Ed Grambo, he had Otto Grambo, he had Martha Grambo, he had Erno, Irma Grambo. Now, Willie was already out by that time, and as he had been, he was through his grade. And so, now, of the Gramberg clan, he had Carl Gramberg, he had Dora Gramberg, he had Bertha Gramberg, he had Louise Gramberg. Now, Alma Gramberg was already through by the time he came back there to teach. She was through the eighth grade, and she was working at the general store in Metz as a clerk there at the general store and post office. So that's how Mother missed out on that. Now, among his other students that he had while he was teaching in Metz, were names that are very familiar to to us who are acquainted in that area. One of his students was uh, Uncle Henry, Uncle er, uh, Uncle Herbert Hine, and uh, another uh, one that you're well acquainted with was John Blasky, who later on worked with him in the bank. There was Walter Santella, a well-known character in the Mets area, and there were a good number of mothers cousins that were in there, the Hardee's family that were on the old homestead. There was Ed Hardee's, there was Adolf Hardee's, there was Henry Hardee's, there was uh, Teresa Hardee's Kowaleski, there was Louise Hardee's Voigt, and there was Albrecht Kowaleski, and there was Max Kowaleski, and there was Walter Satella, and there was the Konechny boys, and the Konechny girls, there were the Ulrichs. There were the Legners, there were the Zelaznys, there were Schmanskys, and there were the Mishlokas, and there were the Huffmans, and uh, several other members of the Hyde family, but and the Schraders. And when you go over that list of students, and I have a list here of many of them that Dad had, you go back there today, still some of the same families living on those same farms that were there 100 years ago. Their descendants are still there in many, many cases. And uh, I, I, know, well, I know one right now, I know only know one of uh, Dad's former students that's still living, a fellow by the name of Irvin Schrader. He lives here in Roger City. He's about 93 years old, or 94 years, 93 or 94 years old. And he's still living, but uh, he said that he had Dad when he was the kindergartner of the first grade. 
He said he went there to the school, he said he couldn't even speak English. Because he said most of the kids in those days, before the time that they went to school, spoke their native German or spoke their native Poland, Polish. And so they had to go to kindergarten to learn how to speak English. But he said we learned fast. He said it didn't take long. And he said, uh, but I, I mean, I, I've talked to him about this. Well, how to get on it. Uh, I don't know just how long Dad taught, but uh, it just so happened that uh, uh, I know that after the first year, he uh, he went to school at Central Michigan at Mount Pleasant to renew his certificate. And then he went back every year to renew his certificate. And uh, then, uh, for some reason or other, I don't know whether he decided teaching wasn't going to be for him, but he went to Ferris Institute not only to renew his certificate, but to take certain courses in business. Now, I don't know what he had in mind, but he did take courses in business. He took courses in business law, he took courses in accounting, he took courses in writing, and uh, bookkeeping. And uh, it just so happened that in the summer of 1907, uh, he was offered a summer job at the Presque Hill Bank in Rogers City if he wanted it. And sure, he wanted it because it would give him a chance to earn a few dollars. Now, it just so happened that the, the man who hired him was Charles Osgood. Charles Osgood was the, uh, was the president of the bank. He was the man who ran the bank. And uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's where they started. That's where he started. Now, that summer job, starting in 1907, lasted until 1953. A period of about 46 years, 47 years, 47, is that right, 47? Yeah, that was a period of 46 years. So you see how, see how, that, see how that develops. And, uh, the, um, now, while Dad, uh, Dad mentioned one thing, that while he was at Ferris taking these courses, one of his teachers was Ferris himself, Woodbridge Ferris, who later became governor of Michigan in the period 1913-1916. And, uh, but he was one of, one of the men that he took the, he had started that institution, and uh, he was one of the main people that was on the faculty. And uh, the uh, the other summer job, as I say, turned into a lifetime proposition. And as you remember, that in 1908, uh, Dad married Mother, and then uh, a few years later, they bought a lot. Uh, over there on 3rd Street, which was just at the end of the lot from where Osgood had built. And uh, I don't know, he, uh, I don't know who Dad bought that lot from. I could look up at my deed, but but uh, I know that originally it was a part of the Gubb estate. A fellow by the name of Gubb owned that property. And, uh, but uh, it was just at the end of the lot, uh, which is now the Presbyterian Church. Now, Dad was, of course, as you remember, he was always a trout fisherman. And uh, very often during the season, uh, even uh, when we were kids, he would be scurrying home and going fishing to Trout River, the Upper Swan, or the Silver, or Little Akiak. He was going with people like uh, Henry Clee, or he was going with people like Schmeichel, or he was going, uh, later on it would be Bill Johnson, who was the local Gamble store uh, bad, but before that, he was a very successful player with the Dodge dealer here in town. He fished with him very, very frequently. In fact, as you re you recall, that Dad and Bill Johnson used to take off a week every summer, and they would go to the Upper Peninsula and just fish trout. That's all they did up there was fish trout. And they fished in the area around Newberry and Grand Marais. And they crawled into all every hole that they could think of up there just to fish. Now, uh, Dad, of course, he, uh, he also fished other places. He and Johnson, in several cases, went down to fish on the, uh, on the uh, Osaba River in the Mayo area. And uh, now also, 
in the fall of the year, uh, inside, inside trout fishing, Dad liked to go out rabbit and partridge hunting. And for a good number of years, while Fred Fish was at the bank, uh, Fred, of course, loved that too. So they would arrange to leave the bank about 3 o'clock, go home and change their clothes, grab their shotgun, and then go out and just didn't make a difference. They went to a different place every time, just to walk around. And uh, if they got a partridge or they got a rabbit, fine. If they didn't, that was all right too. But they just loved to be out in the woods, roaming around. Said uh, Dad said that Fred wasn't much of a hunter because he couldn't sit still long enough to uh, to watch anything and look around. He said he was always on the go. And as you remember, from, I remember Fred Fish, he was always a walker. He was always going wide open. Well, he said that's the way he hunted. But he said Fred wasn't crazy about cleaning anything that he shot anyway, so he didn't bother to shoot anything. He said he just wanted the exercise. And uh, then, of course, and mother and dad, of course, as you remember, and we were kids, they uh, they took a lot of trips, uh, summer vacations. Uh, they, uh, they got into that car and they made trips. They made trips to Florida. They made trips to Kansas, they made Oklahoma. They made trips out east. And uh, on at least two occasions that I remember, dad and mother uh, made trips out to Alberta, Canada, out to see Aunt Emma. Now, Aunt Emma was dad's sister. Dad's old, he was next to dad in age, and she had married a Julius Schultz. And uh, along about 1905, and after they got married, they went out to Alberta, Canada to homestead. That, that area became open by uh, to cut people. And so uh, Emma went out there along with Julius, and then Julius's brother Ed and his wife who was a sister to Uncle Gus, he went, they went out there. These people both homesteaded sections of land out there, wheat farmers. And sometimes they made money, sometimes they lost money. But uh, mother and dad went out to see him, and she said, my gosh, she said when we went out there, between the two families, there was like a reunion of Mets. It was enough to hold a reunion any time you went out there. And then occasionally, of course, these people would load in a couple cars and they would come and they would spend two or three weeks here visiting their relatives and friends. They just didn't come to stay overnight. They came to stay, uh, oh, two or three weeks a month. And of course, part of that time had to be spent uh, visiting uh, George and his brother George in Roger City. Well, you'd get a whole carload of that gang come in and they would settle down on you. And now, of course, there were there were other people that they would visit to in Roger City. They'd visit the Schultz family, which uh, some of them were still here. Julius's, uh, Julius's, in the early days, Julius's uh, mother was was still here, and so there were there are other people that they the visited, of course, that they knew. They, they knew a lot of people from having been lived here as youngsters, and uh, they, uh, as I say, in they would come. Now, there were times when that in the early, early days they came back, the, uh, the upstairs in our home had not been uh, finished off yet. It was still a great big room up there where all you had on that, in that room, the, the back room that I mentioned before had been completed. But the area, the rest of the room was a great big basketball court up there with nothing more than corn husk uh, mattresses on the, on the ground or on the floor. Well, that's where a lot of these people slept. Uncle Julius and Aunt Emma took the bedroom downstairs, and if they brought kids with them, they slept up there. <laughs> Girls on one end and boys on the other. Well, quite often, well, I remember on one occasion where uh, Mother wanted to know how I'm going to sleep with all these people. So she arranged with a Mrs. Schultz, who was just a, uh, about a half a block away, they lived right back in the Valentine house, the Bill Schultz, whether or not she could uh, possibly put up Herman and Harry for a period of four or five days while she had all this company. And Mrs. Schultz uh, said, why, yeah, sure, she had lots of room. The only thing, she only had two kids left out of about six or seven that were home. That was Ed and Ernie. And of course, Ed and Ernie and I, and Herman and I were all good friends. So we're for, for probably a five or five days or six days or whatever it happened to be, uh, we slept over at the Schultz's, and Mrs. Schultz usually provided us with breakfast, too. Well, she was happy to do that, and uh, but, I mean, that's just the way, that's what you did. 
you uh, you just uh, you just help help your neighbors out. Now I re uh, I recall that in the early days at home, that um, we frequently had uh, people over for lunch or supper. That was very common in those days. People would stop in. Uh, the the uh, grandparents would come from Metz, or uh, Carl would come, or maybe Dora and Otto would come, or uh, Herb Ein and Aunt Irma would come, or Gus Litke and Aunt Martha would come. And there were the, hard, uh, the old gang of hard aces from Belknap there uh, that would come. There was, uh, there was Helen, and there was Louise, and there was Bertha, and there was uh, Ed and Paul, and even old grandpa, they would occasionally stop in and uh, stop in for lunch. Now, and uh, and of course, my parents were doing the same thing. They thought nothing of taking a ride out the country and stopping at the Hardee's, and if you're there for lunch, you stop for lunch. That was all there was to it. They were, that was just that was part of the society uh, uh, in that day. That was part of the social life, these exchanges. And this was also true right within Roger City itself. I recall frequently eating at the neighbor's Bertram's. I recall eating over to Valentine's. I re recall eating over to Conert's, which was uh, just down the street, or at the uh, at the Hassey family, or at the Schmeichel family. I mean, uh, Oak family. I mean, y you did these things, and they did the same thing to you. The Oswald Bruder family over here, and uh, the uh, uh, Patzer family. Well, and then there was the Art Granville family, and uh, there were a lot of places in town where you just exchanged, uh, and the men, usually after the win, they would play a little Spitzer. And the kids, they probably played their own games too, I don't forget just what we played, but that was part of the life, part of the social atmosphere uh, of the day. And very, very common. Then, of course, my grandfather, Dramber, he was in town frequently. Because he was he loved, he loved the kind of the political life, and for many many years he was a commissioner of the poor, poor commissioner. That would be the forerunner of the present day welfare society. There were three usually in Presque Isle County at that time. I think there were three poor commissioners. There was a commissioner that covered the western side in the Ottawa area. Then there was a commissioner that covered kind of the middle area. And then there was a commissioner that covered the eastern area, and my grandfather covered the eastern area. He covered like Belknap Township. He didn't cover Roger. He covered Belknap. He covered Metz, Plasky, Posen, Craco, and Presqu'Isle. And if there were problems that had to do with very, very poor folks or somebody ran into tough luck or something like that, just like the welfare system today, they would go and see the commissioner and see whether they could get an assistance or aid. That's the way it worked at that time. And these commissioners usually reported in once a month to uh, the headquarters, which of course was the courthouse here in Rogers City. And there they would review what had been going on with the other commissioners of the uh, of the county. And so he, uh, he usually arranged that one uh, one uh, one one day a month, at least, or two days, whatever it happened to be, that he would uh, he would come to Rogers and stay with George and Alma. And then he'd uh, work at the courthouse during the period of the day, visit with P.H. Heft and a few other of the people that he knew very well at that time. Now, that was a that assignment of being a commissioner uh, was, a, was kind of a very, a very interesting one. And uh, I remember one story that uh, that mother told me, and that was from the early days. He must have been, uh, mother said that she was, you know, she was a little quite young. She said she was probably about, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old, something in that area. And this is just before the fire. And somebody came to see Grandpa that uh, they uh, had a child that just died. A very, very young child died. And for some reason, all these people uh, just did not have any money. They didn't even, uh, what would happen when a child would die or a person would die? If uh, the first thing that would occur after the death had been confirmed by a coroner or some medical priest or another, 
they had a coffin made, or they had bought a coffin that was made. But usually there was a carpenter or something, and one of the farmers had a certain amount of lumber, and he could make a coffin for you. I don't know just what it cost, but nevertheless, that's what they did. And then later on, of course, the undertakers so had a certain supply of these things, but there were people who were carpenters who were also coffin makers. Well, anyway, these people came to see Grandpa uh, and uh, wanted to know whether there was any help. They were just absolutely without funds. And he didn't have any lumber, even to take to a carpenter to build a coffin. Is there anything that they could do, possibly, to get help? Well, I remember Mother said to Grandfather, he really didn't know. He'd never run into that kind of a situation where the people were that desperate, where they didn't even have a few pieces of lumber left that they could uh, build a coffin from or have any credit. So apparently this fellow had no credit, he had nothing. And so uh, he said he didn't, to give back to where we were, I was telling you about this incident uh, that happened to Grandpa, to Granberg, Grandma, Granberg, the mother witness. They were talking about this coffin for this young guy. Young uh, individual had died, and of course, uh, this was at the farm in Metz. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, mother said that uh, Dad said, "Well, just a minute." He said, "I," uh, he said, uh, "I'd like to talk to uh, my wife about this." So, uh, they went out into the kitchen and uh, came back a short time later and said that, "Well, you go ahead. I uh, will see that." it is paid. I'll give you an order, uh, my order, indicating that uh, Mrs. Dramberg and I will pay for that coffin and then we will see what happens later on. And uh, But that's just an example. Now, Mother said that she found out later on that, that uh, they just decided right then and there that they were going to pay for that coffin. There was no need of fooling around. That That's what that's what money was for. Money was to help people. They were very, very liberal people. Grandpa Dramberg and Grandma Dramberg were very liberal with whatever they had. Well, that was witness to the fact that he took off about nine months to spend with me in St. Louis, Missouri. Nobody was paying him. I mean, he was doing that on his own. But uh, that characteristic of being able to give, even though you don't have much, was typical uh, Grandpa Dramberg and Grandma Dramberg. And some of that, I'm not saying that the other people didn't have it too, but of course I was witness to so much of this, that our mother, Alma Gramble, Alma Dramberg Gramble, had some of that same characteristic right in her. She gave away everything. Didn't have much, but she was willing to give whatever she had, and you know that as well as I do. Mother gave and gave and gave. She gave her wealth. She gave more than she should have to those who ask. And that was the same thing with Grandpa and Grandma. They never had much, my gosh, they had just all they had was the clothes on their back, really, even to the time that they died. Now, they never lacked anything, but they never had any big savings. They had no big uh, account, savings account, or checking account, or I, I, I know that Grandma Grandma uh, even at the time that she died, did not have any uh, life insurance. It was just expected that Uncle Carl uh, would provide that. That was her son. They turned the farm over to him. And also, that's true with our mother, Alma Grandma, who just died here a couple of years ago at the age of 102. She had no life insurance. You know that as well as I do. It was to be provided, and it was to be provided out of her state. Well, the uh, we finally scraped up enough money to take care of the burial expenses. The uh, welfare department supplied her with it. They could allow her to keep $2,000, but the total expenses of the funeral were all over four. But that was, that, was man that was managed, but you just didn't insure your wife in those days. That was standard for the course. I know my wife, Marion, only had a $900 life insurance. But the fortunate thing about that case was that over the years, and had uh, she had left all of the uh, all of the returns in there after it was paid up, and by the time that she passed away here uh, about a year and a half ago, there was sufficient money in there to uh, take care of her funeral. 
course, their funeral was somewhat reduced in cost because their body was cremated. But nevertheless, uh, that was very common in those days. You just didn't insure your wife. And uh, so that's the, way, that's the way life went. Now I want to go on today with uh, more stories about our mother, Alma Granberg Granville. Uh, we had mentioned before that, that uh, at age 19, uh, uh, she married our, our dad, uh, George Granville. Now, um, George Granville, of course, uh, as we said, dad had been a teacher there at the Granville School, but he never did have mother as one of his students as he did the rest of her brothers and sisters. At age uh, probably about 14, she started working at the Hardee's General Store in Metz. Uh, Hardee's, of course, the Hardee's boys were her uncles. And um, the, uh, there she worked on a variety of, of projects. She waited on trade, and um, she um, took care of uh, uh, opening boxes of stock as it came in off the train to put on the shelves. And uh, now, I remember asking her, I said, well, just what did you have there? You hear about these general stores in the early days? Well, she said, it was really a great big department store. She said, it was almost like Sears Roebuck. She said, every, they had every, a little bit of everything there that you could think of for a farm area. Uh, and then she mentioned that uh, there were a few things that were already canned, but she said, a lot of stuff was packed in barrels or in boxes, and you count things out by the dozen or by the pound or the beans or peas or whatever it happened to be. Uh, you uh, you took them out of bigger boxes and put them into small sacks. And uh, she said, for example, she said there were such things as uh, dried prunes and uh, apricots. And there were bolts of yards of dried goods of all types of descriptions. There were patterns for making uh, simple clothing. And um, she said they sold sewing machines. And um, they sold a certain amount of ladies' garments, and uh, uh, that is not only really just dresses, but blouses, skirts, and then, of course, they sold also some undergarment material. And um, they sold uh, needles and pins and thread and tobacco in various forms, whether it was uh, smoking tobacco, whether it was chewing tobacco, or whether it was plug tobacco, and, uh, or cigarette tobacco. Uh, anything that through the form of tobacco they had there. And then there's also in the back area there, there was a good big store that they had there, and there's a back storeroom, and there were back sheds on top of that. And uh, they could, they would even sell hay or straw, or brick or tinware, or they sold pipe and uh, mortar supplies, or simple trowel tools, or simple garden tools, or simple hand tools, carpenter's tools, chalks and salves and eggs. And butter, this old cheese, and uh, uh, simple candies, and uh, pots and pans and kettles and cutlery and butcher knives and spices and kerosene lamps and kerosene, and uh, lamp, lamp, lamp chimney supplies, uh, wicks and lanterns, uh, farm tools, even some plows and binders and mowers and discs and rakes and cultivation uh, material, lumberjack supplies tools and clothing, and uh, and even to an order on, uh, you order a lot of this stuff, and uh, beds or furniture or chairs or tables. She said, I, she said, some of this early stuff that we had when we were married was ordered there at the, at the general store. That came in by train. And she said, one of my big jobs uh, was always to prepare orders. They would, uh, they would always write down a list of the things that they needed, and I uh, almost daily I sent out orders to uh, to the companies. Now the biggest signal supplier that we had at that time, and there were many small ones, but the biggest signal supplier we had was out of a firm out of Chicago called Carson Perry, Perry Scott. And uh, their specialty was selling to general stores throughout the country, uh, all over, all over I suppose, probably all over the Midwest. And I uh, imagine every general store <laughs> in northern Michigan, uh, throughout the area here, was ordering for Carson Perry, from Carson Perry Scott in Chicago. And uh, these supplies would come in by train. The order would go out by train, and oh, a week, 10 days later, or sometimes two weeks later, that order would come in. 
and uh, you ordered the farm machinery for them. You'd order binders and plows and rakes and and um, anything that. Uh, if I suppose if they didn't have it, they went and got it and, and made it a part of their inventory. And because um, if it was good for one area of the country, it was probably good for another area too in many ways. And um, so. Uh, that's the kind of work that Mother did at that, uh, that store. Now, in addition to operating a general store, that Hardy's general store was also the post office. They had a small area there that was set aside, and uh, there you sold people's stamps, and uh, they got their mail there uh, as it came in off of the trains. And if you wanted to mail a letter there, small packages, uh, they would have had a lot. The bigger packages, of course, you had to take over to the depot. But. Um, it, uh, it was also a, a separate business. And um, the, uh, now, I don't know, just, well, she worked there from a period from, she, she told me from a period when she was about 14 until she was about 19 when she got married. And then uh, some of the one, uh, I think Aunt Bertha and Louise at times also worked there. I think at the actual time of the fire, it was either Aunt Bertha or Aunt Louise were working at the store. So, um, uh, the Hardy's brother, the boys, had been in business for, of course, some time. Now I might say that this, this same, these same Hardy's uh, boys had also first had a, a general store at the South Rogers area. Now South Rogers was just a railroad crossing a mile west of of, um, of Metz, and that had been built up first. Uh, south Rogers was just directly south of the city of Rogers City. That's why they called it South Rogers. We probably about, oh, maybe about, and then had a little general store there. One time it even had a doctor there of the name of Dr. Parr, and had a blacksmith shop, and had a small area where Mother said that they used to hold church services or they held dances, and she said as a young girl, she occasionally would walk to South Rogers down the track. There were some other people there, some of the other younger, younger people there, younger girls that they went to visit, and she said frequently so that she and Bertha Louise would walk to South Rogers, to attend a Sunday school. It was conducted by a Methodist uh, uh, teacher. I don't know whether it was a preacher or not, but uh, they conducted a Sunday school there. And she said, as uh, young people, we wanted to take part in the things that other young people were taking part in. And she said, some of the people that went to that Sunday school were, uh, were like us, they were Lutherans, and some of them were Episcopals, and some of them were Catholics, whoever lived in, the, in that whole neighborhood there. She said, they all went to the, because it was just kind of a social gathering. She says some of the some of the Catholic families she remembers distinctly were there, were the Centellas, and were the uh, uh, Haskies, and the uh, Kanechnies. And, but she said there were all a lot of young people there just like she was, and uh, there didn't seem to be any, any if there were animosities that created within the church areas, years, that came years afterwards. These people were, didn't have that in them yet at that time. Now, a mother, as a young girl, learned how to play the organ. Now, just how that all came about originally, but she took her lessons from my Reverend Timmy. Now, Reverend Timmy was the minister of the Lutheran Church in Metz there at St. Peter's. Now, he, uh, on the side, he uh, would give people lessons, and he had, mother said he had a good number of, of, of uh, students. She said uh, that uh, took lessons from him. She took lessons. And now she says she doesn't, re uh, I don't remember just, just how she did that, how she practiced. Whether whether she went uh, to the church to practice or whether the organist, or whether the minister, I think he had a separate organ in his home. And uh, because he played, he played of course very well, Mother said. And, uh, but these kids would come in there to take lessons and uh, she said uh, it, uh, it wasn't, uh, she said there were a good number of them. And in some of those cases, she said these people, after the kid learned to play, the uh, the folks, if they had a little money, they bought an organ. And she said, now the Dramberg family, she said, she said, uh, I don't recall that there was a, mom, I say, I say, I don't. I don't recall that mother had an organ in the home, in the Dramberg home. But I know the Grambo house did have an organ. And because I remember it being there, we, uh, well, of course, if they had one at the Dramberg home at the time the mother was there, it would burn. But, um, I mean, after that, there was never an organ there where there was an organ at the Granville home in Metz. Now, it is true that right after 
uh, mother and dad were married, shortly after they were married, after they were a new home over here on 3rd Street, that they bought an organ. Because mother loved to play and she could play very well. And she was quite accomplished. <coughs> but she's, as I say, at about age 14, she started to play and be the organist for the St. Peter's Lutheran Church there in Metz. And she accumulated a quite a size, personal uh, library of uh, organ music. Both, uh, both uh, the wordings in certain cases were German, some of them were English. Now, she kept all those books after, after uh, in, the, in the after years, and uh, many, many years later, oh gosh, she was up, in her, near, up near her 80s. She packed all those books up and she sent them to Hugh Gramble. <laughs> Hugh at the time was living in California. I think he was working for the San Diego Sun Times out there as a newspaper man. And but he did have access to an organ, and I think Hugh has got all a mother's uh, library of uh, organ music. My mother used to play a lot as a, a youngster, as I remember, when I guess probably just Herman and I and mother and dad were home. But she would go in there and play by the hour on that organ, and then dad would. Dad learned, I don't know how he learned to play, but he could actually play that organ. And, um, but Dad had an accordion. He had a small accordion, as you remember, that he didn't play too much in later years, but as a, as a, as a youngster, I remember he played quite often. He'd play that organ while, that accordion while Mother would play the organ. And uh, there were times when uh, the two played for company. When company would come over, uh, you know, for an evening meal or something like that, Singing, of course, was very, very common form of entertainment. Mother would play the organ, and then they, they would sing, or Dad would uh, also get out the accordion, and he would accompany Mother, and uh, they would have a little sing fest. That was very common. That was very common on the Metz farm, too, as I remember, in the Dramberg family. I recall being out there as a youngster when they would have a, a, some kind of occasion, event, a baptism, or, or a birthday party, or some event would take place, some anniversary, the neighbors would all come in, and I remember uh, listening, uh, not listening, being right there. Here are the, uh, the men, my grandfather Grambo and grandfather Dramberg and Mr. Schrader, and uh, probably uh, all Mr. Schloka, Mr. Bujik, Mr. Kowaleski. All the old men would gather in the kitchen. These fellows were, of course, all from Germany. And they would sing a cappella. Boy, they could really sing. They knew all the old military songs of, that came out of, of, uh, of uh, Germany. And not just military songs, but all the general songs, of old favorites. And they would sing by the hour. Beautiful, beautiful voices. And, uh, but that was a common form of entertainment. Just, uh, just plain singing. And a um, very, very common form of entertainment also in the, in the early schools. I know that, uh, that we used to do a lot of it. Uh, when I was even going to high school, we'd have sing fests. Usually every Friday afternoon for 15, 20 minutes, the whole upper class, 7th through 12th grade, would get together in the assembly, and H.H. Uh, Gilpin would lead the singing. And we would sing for 20 minutes, a half hour, full blast, and everybody enjoyed it. And, but that was, the, that was just part of the entertainment, and that's how you learn the songs. Mother had a great, great memory of all those songs that she learned as a child, all the poetry that she learned as a, as, a, as a child. And I remember even being up in extended care and going in and, uh, and uh, seeing Mother. And uh, she would be down in the, in the general area there where they, off the a whole group meet, and Mother would be in there entertaining these, oh, these people. What should she be entertaining with them? She was entertaining with poetry that she had learned as a kid. And she still remembered all of those poems that came from years and years ago. What a beautiful, beautiful memory. The same way with songs. She knew the songs of all of those old hymn books. But of course, she had an opportunity to do that because she had been the organist for about five years at St. Peter's. And so she knew those songs in both English and German. But of course, she knew those, but those early songs. Of course, that was all German in the, in the church at that time, the early church. So, but... Um, she, uh, organ music was one of her specialties, and, uh, and it was interesting to note that later on, after the kids came along, after George and, and uh, Grace and the twins, the folks decided that the, uh, that the organs were going out and pianos were coming in. So they arranged to buy a piano, 
I think it was a Grinnell, as I recall it, and came out of Detroit someplace. And after we got that, that pian piano came in, well, then what to do with the organ? And I know at that time, that organ was given to St. Peter's Church in Metz. Now, uh, what happened to that organ? <coughs> Since that time, I do not know. But I know at the time, it was given there. Now, they did have an organ, but uh, after all, this was a spare then. Now, somebody told me that at one time, they had the, one of the organs was upstairs, where the choir often sang, and the other one was downstairs, which, of course, could have been very, very logical, because you do that in some churches even today, where you have a kind of a lobby where the uh, choir sings from, and that's usually equipped with some musical instrument, some organ or piano, or now an electric organ, of course, so that wouldn't be at all unusual. Now, um, but uh, she, uh, as I say, to get back, she learned to play the organ uh, from the uh, minister in, uh, in Metz. Now, the, um, I often talk to mother, I said, well, what do you, what do you people do as young youngsters there? I said, as young people. She said, oh, she said, we would gather together at every opportunity, of course, and uh, just meet and talk. And she said, there was a lot of dancing. She said, uh, dancing was very, very popular. Now she said, the, all you had to do is just uh, have somebody who had a fiddle or have an accordion or have a mouth organ. And she said, there were no ordinary dance halls. Now, there were a few places where they had dances at, at kind of town halls. But she said, ordinarily, if people just danced in their home, they just kind of clear out the furniture and uh, go to it. And, but she said, everybody learned how to dance. She said, uh, well, she said practically in every family, every kid, learn how to dance as a very young as a very young person and she said that uh, uh, she should you talk, you should uh, talk about uh, talking about dances she said, well, she, said uh, she said that that was true she said she said she remembered the first time that she danced with the with our dad and she said that happened at the Granville house she said they went over there for some occasion whether it was a uh, some anniversary in a way, but there she said there were a group of five or six families that got together there, and uh, first thing you know, uh, somebody broke out the violin, Uncle Gus could play the violin, and she said uh, there were other people there that had accordions, and they strike up a tune, and pretty soon she said they would be dancing, not only just the kids, but some of the adults would dance too. But she said dancing was a very, very common form of entertainment. And she said, then she said, like, hi. Well, wait a minute here. Yeah, wait a minute here. Yeah, you heard me. I'm now to get back to uh, the story we were at, Mother was talking about the uh, young people in the area, or all of those farm families, would know how to dance. And they provided a lot of home entertainment for themselves. Uh, well, they had to, because there was just no other place to go. It's too far to go for entertainment in Rogers City or Alpena. So there, there were other forms of entertainment. Uh, Mother said that um, uh, at one time when she, after she was going with Dad, that she and Dad and, and another couple uh, took the train and went to uh, Mackinac City and then took the ferry and went to Mackinac Island and spent the day there. Stayed overnight in Mackinac City and then took the train back the next day. And she said on another occasion, she said there were about six of the girls who had all taken uh, organ lessons from the Reverend Timmy, uh, decided that they would go to uh, Mackinac Island for an outing. And so they did. They, uh, there was Mother and there was uh, Mamie Zimmerman, she remembered, and uh, there was uh, a Huffman girl, and uh, there was a uh, Helen Schultz, who was later, later on Mrs. Ed Wenzel, the mother of Penny Wenzel, and then there was a, uh, a uh, there were six of them, total, a total of six. One was a, as I say, a Husky, a Huffman, and I believe a Centella girl, but there were six of them. These six girls had all taken lessons from Timmy. So they took the train out of Metz, <coughs> and they went up through uh, Hawkson, Millsburg, and Ottawa and uh, a low estate park at Sheboygan, and up to Sheboygan, then up to Mackinac. At Mackinac, they rented a room in a, in a home up there, a big room that had two, uh, had two big beds in it, and uh, 
They left their luggage there, and uh, then they took a ferry. They went to Mackinac Island. They spent a day on Mackinac Island, uh, a little carriage ride, I suppose a little souvenir hunting, and uh, also, of course, had to take a trip and go to see the Grand Hotel. And Mother said the interesting thing that she recalls that happened at that time was that uh, when they were walking, another uh, other various groups of young people, a lot of young people that were going up there for vacations, uh, somebody pointed out that in among the group of young people that were walking down, there was one young man who they identified as the son of the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, one of Theodore Roosevelt's sons. 